Good evening. <laughs> Welcome. It's great to see so many of you here for the very first lecture of this uh, semester. It's also wonderful to have uh, Jacques Herzog here with us, in fact, to have Rafa here with us and all the, all the faculty. Um, uh, Jacques Herzog has been a faculty member, a friend of the school for a very, very long time. Um, he hasn't lectured here for a couple of years, maybe, but um, he has been doing uh, with Pierre together a series of very interesting studios, most recently uh, the one in Basel that is really um, been focusing on issues related to landscape and the extension of cities and the whole question of sprawl, which was a really um, amazingly exciting studio. Um, a number of the students who were in that studio are, are now back in the school, or some of them have just done their thesis. Um, and uh, these studios have been going on for a number of years in <clears throat> collaboration and conjunction with uh, some of the students at uh, ETH uh, Basel. And hopefully we will also continue these uh, projects in the years to come. I think uh, I will try to be very brief, but you know, um, Jacques and Pierre are very, very special people, are very special architects. And uh, they, they come out of um, school at a very sort of, I think, special moment, a particular time in the, in the uh, 70s uh, when they also started their own practice. And I think uh, they have been able, uh, partly because of that, that specific moment, they've been able to be part of a series of very important uh, discussions that have been happening in Europe uh, in the late 60s and 70s but also to go beyond those discussions and to construct, in a way, uh, a practice that has been very unique and has been so influential, um, uh, in particular because of the way that um, they engaged with art very early on and the whole issue of materials, new forms of sensibility, the coloration of things, all of those really affected their work in um, such a deep way. I think for many people who were students here um, at the GSD, for example, in the late 80s or 90s, I think things like the Ricola you know, building, I think, were very important um, uh, projects uh, to really understand how such a simple storage building could also be so evocative, um, something that would have such a special um, character, quality, uh, almost as a monument uh, for a storage building. So there's a lot that one could really say, and I think all of you know this, but I think they've also gone on and become, in, in many respects, um, uh, specialists or experts in uh, many different kind of typologies, specifically uh, a lot of museum buildings with the Tate, with the Schalager, which is such a beautiful building, uh, with the De Young. So one can also see in their work how they are approaching a certain topic in very different ways, in very different conditions, but every time pushing the work um, uh, further forward. One sort of unusual typology in a way for a contemporary architect, uh, but not at all unusual for Jacques, is the football stadium. And as you probably know, he's a very ardent supporter of uh, the football team in Basel, um, against uh, the advice of many people, I'm sure. No. <laughs> um, but no, this is a fantastic team. And he has built so many of these stadia. And um, obviously, now they're finishing the one in, in Bordeaux and uh, the one at Stamford Bridge, which is for Chelsea, which is also going to happen. And this is also a really really exciting way to deal with this idea of the stadia, of the kind of uh, place of, uh, for warriors of, uh, of the contemporary scene, at least in the European context, and more and more becoming part of the, the American scene as well. So um, we're very uh, lucky to have uh, Jacques here, because he uh, not only has been working on these very sort of uh, particular materially based projects in the practice, but it's also with Pierre been involved in a lot of um, 
theoretical and worldly issues, um, such as this discussion around uh, the countryside, landscape, sprawl, but also the work that they did before with us um, uh, focusing on Africa and really always wanting to combine these two sides of the practice, the kind of investigative, the kinds of things that are really unusual for him, that they are um, maybe sometimes um, you know, um, uncertain territories with things that the office has been doing in such a systematic way. Now they have an office of over 400 people and they're working in, in lots and lots of places around the world on 50 different projects. And tonight, Jack is just going to share a very few projects with us, but uh, I'm looking forward to hearing him speak and seeing the projects. Please welcome Jack Herzog. Thank you, Mohsen. Good evening. <clears throat> Thank you for the invitation um, to lecture. Um, I would like to thank also many friends that I haven't seen for many years uh, that they join us tonight. Um, as Mohsen said, um, I will just present a few very few projects, in fact, uh, five only. And um, normally I try to put together something from different periods, but I, this time I rather present very recent things, not things that we have recently imagined or, or worked on, but recently completed uh, in the last year. And we have, in fact, in 2015, we have finished or opened um, 11 different projects, uh, out of which, as I said, I will speak about um, uh, four of them, Miu Miu, Chazeruk, um, and BBUVA, the bank, and um, Unterlinden at the far left, uh, which is a museum and expansion and a renovation project um, in Alsace, in the French um, neighborhood of Basel. Um, maybe I go back one thing. Um, of course, I could also explain a little bit the other projects, but the ones that I selected make sense in comparing them. So I, rather than just speak about the different projects, I like to um, come closer to what was important to us in that I compare them with each other. Uh, so I decided to compare Miu Miu uh, with Prada that we've done 15 years ago. So they are somehow siblings, very different, but uh, one explains a bit the other, or one works better with the other. I could, of course, also uh, speak about the stadium in Bordeaux, which is very close to our heart, which I think is really an interesting stadium in that it's so different from, let's say, Allianz Arena in Munich. I could also, had also have presented those two stadiums, because we, I'm deeply convinced in football, which is such a European sport, it's a world sport, but it's so... Um, such a European sport, it's also, of course, a South American sport, it becomes an Asian sport, even an American sport, but it's very European in that in Europe you have like different football cultures. You have, of course, Spanish culture, but of course you have English culture, which is the homeland of soccer. You have German culture, which we don't really know what it is, we just know that they win. <laughs> we just know that they win always. And, um, so there would be a lot of flesh on the bone, so to speak, to talk about these things and to associate the kind of architecture that goes with it. Uh, Bordeaux, I think, is a very elegant, uh, refined architecture that would be impossible, let's say, in England. And you will see maybe when we could present uh, the Chelsea Stadium for Stamford Bridge, uh, which has a much more gothic, almost Lord of the Rings side to it, and which is right, I think, for this um, 
particular site in the west of London. Anyway, let's focus on the first two projects, uh, Prada Aoyama and Miu Miu, and they are a kind of a juxtaposition of two totally different types of buildings. Um, you may remember the project we've done for Prada, which certainly I think is one of the best buildings we've done, I think, personally. Um, and um, there are a few ingredients which I believe are still valid, and uh, when we saw the building again last year when we opened Miu Miu, uh, you could see as an architect whether how, how well a building survives and lives without you. You've gone away, it's 15 years ago, and the building is still very fresh. Um, it's fresh because it's what we have been thinking and developing is still something that is very much worrying us, is very much around us, and very much something that I also like to speak about. Clearly, this building is about transparency, obviously. But it's also about this little space, this little plaza. Um, So we made place for this little plaza, which adds a European element, because normally buildings in Tokyo and Japan are filling out every single square centimeter, so nothing is left for the public. It's about this space, and as I said, it's of course about transparency. Uh, we wanted a building which is made of glass, but is not just a kind of glass facade like in an office building, but has these glass bubbles, which are literally seductive and attracting the eye, the human eye and the human perception, bulging in and out, concave and convex. So that's a very obvious, very seductive piece that we tried to achieve. But we also knew that we could not just make a glass bubble, but they need to be structured. So that structure also is something that we developed for this building. So it's like stiffening the building, but it's also presenting enclosed hermetic spaces within this um, whole and large open glass space. And these, this structure is not just a decoration. At the end, it works like... Um, it works like the ornament of the building, but the ornament is the structure and the structure is the space. So the three main elements and ingredients of any architecture are just somehow one thing. Whatever is defining the building structurally is at the same time space making and the same time the expression of the ornament. The ornament in a holistic sense of the word and not misunderstood as decoration, which is very often something people can mix up and in fact has nothing to do with each other. As you can see, those spaces, those structural tubes are for the changing rooms, but also to present um, a dress or something that one selects in a more private, more intimate spatial condition. This photograph um, shows how much these elements are really solid structure, just like the facade. And how then it's totally changed through its fitting out. And uh, with all the Prada building, you will also see that with Miu Miu, which is the same company, Miu Miu is the nickname for Miucha Prada, um, is um, all the f materials and all the furniture, all the lamps and silicon and, and all these snorkel elements, everything is designed, we've designed for that building, just as it was also the case for Miu Miu this year. The structure becomes more obvious at night, of course, and um, the glass, this kind of bulging, convex and concave glasses, are here in order to attract the human eye more. So this attraction comes, of course, from this forming the glass. And you may have seen those shop windows from the beginning of the 20th century, these concave glasses, which are bending away from the viewer on the street, which, which make 
the object in the shop window almost um, real, as if the, there was no glass. It makes the glass somehow disappear. That's uh, uh, an effect of, the, of bending the glass backwards, away from the viewer. And that's, in fact, the effect that you get when you stand outside of the building in some of the windows, whereas others are rather rejecting you. So it's a, almost an interactive play between inside and outside. <coughs> when we have been asked to do um, Miu Miu, this is the Prada building, it's on the same street in Japan, in Tokyo, right across the street. We were, of course, happy but also hesitating because um, we knew that it would be difficult to do a building which would be so well seen and well accepted as the Prada was. But we said we are interested not in on, only in doing buildings which are, let's say, has, is number one, number two, number three. You can always do something which is, um, which is more accepted or less accepted. What we wanted to do is to take the opportunity to to do something which speaks to each other. Just as you will see later in the next two projects, that building, especially on an urban level, um, can have this effect. This is just a box, but it's an, kind of a magic box in that transparency, unlike in the Prada building, is not a real transparency, but it's a game. It's a play with transparency, with a kind of, um, um, how do you say, furtive? Um, I have to check that. Um, sorry, I'm soon there. Yeah, furtive, a kind of a furtive um, <laughs> transparency. Um, the zoning, as you could see here, does not allow for a tall building just like Prada was, but rather for a small one. And uh, so we limited the height and tried to make a box out of it, which is playing with this idea of the box, with this simplicity, with its radical simplicity, and with this um, um, very simple, almost obvious um, plastic or sculptural moment, which is this kind of um, opening, slightly opening, which, as I said before, allows for this furtive um, perception of what is inside. Of course, before we've done that, we tried other um, things, uh, as you can see here, but we found this very simple gesture the most powerful one. We then try to figure out what could be the right materials for that. We um, tried, of course, metal, stone, wood, all these possibilities, and decided for metal that would be sharp like a razor blade. So it's a very sharp also contrast to the fitting out, to the interior, which is very, very refined, extremely um, carefully um, crafted and designed, as I said before, uh, the interior is really uh, almost like a theater and every single piece was developed just for there. And for us, we look at those um, projects, Prada or Miu Miu, like also a laboratory for de to develop new materials and new um, products. And this is also possible because Mucha Prada um, is certainly uh, a fashion designer that everybody knows, but what few people know is how inspired she is. She's really one of the great artists of 
our time. And she's also a really very um, great um, collector of art and very knowledgeable person. So working with them is a real challenge, an intellectual challenge, and an interesting experience. There were moments where we wanted to do the inside uh, out of very rough concrete, steel, and kind of an upholstered foam plastic shelves. We stepped away from all these things and uh, went back to more traditional materials like brocade, but tried to find a more contemporary version and mix brocade with metal or with copper and juxtapose these materials. We simplified the arrangement it's very mindful, as I said, of a theater. We gave those spaces an almost kind of an erotic um, character, very intimate character. And there are, of course, materials like these, punching these metal blades and these concrete tests that we rejected and will perhaps use in other projects. And like always, um, we try many things and a lot is, doesn't work or is, doesn't lead anywhere. But I think sometimes we find out something just because we try it. You cannot imagine everything and then you produce it. Sometimes it's important to accept this testing and for instance the Dominus winery, this kind of stone masonry that these loose stones that we filled in the Gabians is the result of course of some idea but namely of testing it and finding out about the potential for the sun to shine through and to project those gaps on the glass walls and to produce this uh, lace kind of um, uh, shade that is so beautiful. So the copper and the brocade and the sharp metal were selected to go in the building. Also the furniture were developed for this particular place and might find a way into other projects. There is also a gap, not only in the front, but also in the back. So like um, the backdrop that is opening and lets this kind of little, open up this little gap for people to sneak in. Again, you can see that here, which is kind of weird um, opening into this very intimate um, interior space. And when I talk about transparency, that might sound weird uh, in comparison to the building on the other side, which has a real transparency here. We, um, as I said, we did the building in steel, in very sharp, like a blade, steel, kind of a steel. But we wanted not to do additional window. We just wanted this gap, which is allowed for this furtive um, kind of um, look into the building. But on the other hand, we decided to polish the steel, so somehow to create a kind of a porosity, like enter into the material and reveal another side. So it is um, a kind of opening, but it reflects you instead of le letting you into the interior of the building. So it rejects your image, but at the same time it, it attracts you. So there is this kind of um, sculptural moment which we find interesting that a real transparency, a, a, a transparency which is rejecting you and attracting you, and um, all the different ways and all these different moments in between.
So it even reflects the building on the other side of the street. I would also like to present two projects that we've done last year, which seem at first sight very different. Um, but we find it interesting to present them in the context because they both speak of um, a specific idea about the city. Um, BBVA is a headquarter for a bank, just for one company, but it's like a little city. And Musée Untolind in Colmar is a um, renovation and expansion project for a monastery, for a museum in a monastery. And um, Colmar is about a real medieval, medievally kept city, which in this part of the city was deteriorated, or was um, 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 not in the, in, the, in the good condition. It was somehow um, uh, a place where the monastery was isolated. You will see that later. So it's about bringing back the, the quality of the city that it had before. And in the case of the BBVA project, it is um, almost a tabula rasa, kind of a place in an in a area, in a kind of a wasteland uh, outside Madrid, near the airport, almost a desert, kind of a deserted kind of a urban landscape, where the idea is really how to build there to do something which is more than just do a building for a bank, more than just um, uh, a building that, fun that fulfills its function. So both projects are in fact about what can you do as an architect to, do, to deal with the city before you deal with the building, or how can the building be done in a way that it works for the city. And that's why I show this um, palace that Aldo Rossi liked so much this, um, this comparison of the Diocletians, the Palace of Diocletian, which, is, um, which was transformed into uh, a city. So this piece of the city is the real heritage of the palace. And the palace as a building, the power of the building, the permanence of the building was so strong and was so important and that's his, Aldo Rossi's belief that it always could be the basis of a certain typology for a city. So what I think is still interesting in this thinking is that buildings can have the potential to um, work for um, a future nucleus of a city. They can become part of um, place for people to live, which goes beyond the function of a bank or a museum or a football stadium or whatever it is. And we tried to conceive both projects with such a dimension or with such a thought in the back uh, of our mind. This is this kind of a deserted landscape as opposed to the coherent, more coherent landscape of Madrid, the city we all uh, know and love for its liveliness, for the quality of life it has on the streets, uh, which I still think is unbelievably amazing and is hardly, can hardly be seen um, uh, outside uh, southern cities, especially in Europe. But how can you achieve such a quality in this kind of uh, chaotic um, um, areas? And in fact, this is the place for the project. It is divided by highways and by different models of a city, of isolated islands and of freestanding uh, buildings. And in the case of BBVA, the client bought that piece of land on which there were already some buildings that were not fully completed. So they were like modern ruins. And one of the, um, one of the wishes the client had for the competition was that we would be able, or the participants would be able to somehow deal with these given structure because he was paying for it. So it was real material, it was something that the client wouldn't want to lose. 
And we were quite happy, actually, about the possibility to incorporate them in our design. As I said, that's the reality of that area, something that you could see anywhere in the world, almost. And something that we saw as a challenge <clears throat> and tried to find an alternative. Those are the buildings as we found them on the site before we interfered with our concept that I will explain later. So that's the kind of ugliness that is there and was there that shortly before our intervention. That's the site for the project. So we said, whatever we do here would not be just a building, a tower, or some kind of block, but we wanted something that is totally coherent, like a world in itself, but could be, once the bank is not a bank anymore, or banks don't have this kind of um, monopole, kind of economic monopole character anymore, mo once it's more fragmented, once it has changed, the the building or the site would have the potential to become a kind of the nucleus of a different kind of a city. So since the beginning, that was in our mind, and the early sketches, low-rise buildings, that's a kind of a section, and this kind of carpet, like a piece of textile that we would want to lie on top of the landscape, was in our mind with very thin fingers and gardens in between, low rise, and the same should happen in this kind of adjacent piece where the first phase should be built, these existing structures. And from the beginning we said we want to incorporate them in that we cut through them, we literally incorporate and eat them up and make them become part of the same kind of arrangement. Um, almost in a kind of a Gordon Mataclarkian way or in the kind of a strategy of Gordon Matta Clark to cut them, to open them up and reveal something that you would not have seen before. And especially to not accept the typology that they had become the typology of the rest of the um, site, but vice versa. Use their materiality, but reverse their character. From the beginning also we decided to cut into the alfombra, into the carpet, and, um, and cut it out and tilt it up. This plaza tilt it up and make it into a um, vertical piece. We had five and more fingers in the competition. We wanted uh, endless repetition, so undistinguishable kind of buildings. We wanted more the repetition and the in and out and in and out, the change between built and unbuilt, between garden and interior space. But we could then live also with four fingers. As an architect, that's also a lesson that even now that we are very experienced, we are still astonished that we would never have accepted that in the, build, in the competition phase because we thought this would be too standard, too conventional, but in fact, the effect of this transparency that you see all the way through works very well, even with fewer fingers. This is the gardens that run through the whole site. And that's the arena, this kind of roundish place. Of course, this is not a one-to-one -one comparison, but to, to cut out this space and to make it an arena kind of a space where people would come together was somehow in the back of our mind. We cut out that space and tilted it up and gave it the same height as the height of the existing um, BBVA tower. That is quite an interesting building, actually. So there is a kind of a reference uh, that we so there was a ratio for the height of our building, of the new building. In the competition, the, that building, that slab, was in the same line with the rest. That also we changed later. We gave it a north-south orientation. We wanted to free it from the rest, and especially we wanted to tilt it, to orient it towards the highway as a sign. 
That is a wish of the client. We were at some point not even sure whether we wanted really a to have a high rise, have a taller piece. But at the end of the day, it works pretty well if, you, if you're there. And especially, it gives you alternative spaces so you can also escape these very low rise um, um, spaces here and these gardens and um, have meeting rooms and offices also in totally different spatial conditions. You can see the gap between the interior space and the outside is filled with these kind of stairs that we organized in a way that they could also work as spaces to hang out, to talk, to smoke a cigarette, so more than just normal um, exit or uh, escape stairs. That's the scenario of how we proceeded. That's the existing, were the existing buildings, and that's the transformation of them in the first phase to the fully completed scheme where we cut, we took away, we cut, and we added to this structure. So we liked the physical operation on those existing buildings. That is one part of why we, build, we believe the building has become very powerful. You see this, this kind of brutal um, concrete structure, which with all these columns and these slabs, which are really very straightforward, um, somehow it expired and informed the rest of the structure. So we not only reused it, but we took on board the structure, which is not dissimilar, by the way, to the structure of this space here. We have these three elements, the alfombra, which is the carpet, the plaza, and the tower. It's very strategic and very almost dialectic. It has, it accepts the slope, which also I think is very important. It's not just a stiff structure, but it has a kind of a gentle way to follow the given landscape. It is, as I said, totally transparent. It has these plants in between. So everything literally reads as like a woven horizontal layer. That was the rendering before um, we developed the single details, but you can see this up and down of the slab. You can see the, how the plants and the interior space are blurring into each other. We added this element on top that helps shade those gaps. You can also see that the irregular, irregularity of these gaps, which is resulting from uh, the fact that some structures are existing, give the whole thing uh, the character of an almost an old part of town, which is also somehow wanted. And you can see in that image, or also in that image, what I tried to explain earlier, now this is a bank, it's just one client. This person and that person and that person, they all work for the same person. They have the same kind of uh, mentality. But they meet here, and it has already now a, a kind of an aspect like in a small city. And I could imagine having a bar here, you could have a shoe, whatever, repair, and you can have a hairdresser, you could have different stores that would be um, inhabiting this structure sometime in the future. You could fragment it and you could give it to different tenants. Which of course now is totally different. But also the bank, after problems we've had at the beginning, honestly the client now is very happy with this very unusual way for them to work under one roof in this kind of um, common spaces. Those spaces, of course, are nice, but they also are very useful um, for people to, um, in the break, to have lunch, to have even meetings outside. We also use that sculptural form to collect the water and to 
store it and to bring it back into these different gardens. So it, the whole project has a very uh, well thought um, ecological component. The building is finished, more or less. The tower is not yet even finished. That's why I cannot show pictures of the inside. Um, so it's really fresh. But I thought it was important nevertheless, because I, I think it's possible to already understand the main ingredients. The last one being the facade. This is, of course, a project which, in fact, has no facade. Why should we do a facade in the project inside where the facade is actually the plants, or is that space in between? So it's a non-facade kind of a thing, and potentially endless. But of course, there's a strong sun exposure, so we had to def this, uh, develop something, and we were very interested in what you see here, to give back the Brie Soleil, which we are normally associating very much with modernism, especially with Le Corbusier's uh, attempts, and we thought that to bring back the Brie Soleil could be a very interesting challenge. To not copy um, Le Corbusier's um, ideas, but to rethink it and come up with alternatives or with, with uh, other, other um, moments in it. That would have been a, a kind of a, a logical way to start to do use concrete, but it was too heavy to use very straightforward rectangular slabs, but this was take away too much light. Then to just chop it off a little bit, that was not enough. Then to give it this kind of form, that would, was, was having too much of a Saudi Arabian, Abu Dhabi, Dubai kind of a <laughs> style, which we also didn't want. And we then tested all these things, which are some very mathematical forms, and what we, th we somehow liked them, but some were just too much. But more we went into this, we understood what actually a Brie Soleil is, in contrast to just a normal sunshade or a store. It is actually a very powerful architectural tool, because it somehow you can see that here better, perhaps. No, here. Because somehow it creates in front of you, um, we have developed um, elements with different, um, with different uh, width, you know, of the window. But it creates like a space in front of you, so it's like a space between you and outside. It's not just a layer, but it's a real space which gives you a certain intimacy, which I find a very interesting component, a very interesting element that normally you don't have in a facade. Those are other tests where this idea of the space outside is even taken further almost like uh, an interpretation of those sun stores that we know from Venice, where they are done in fabric. Uh, so they would really be almost like capsules, like little tents in front. But we then decided for simpler versions with this cut out, with this thinner um, forms, but with different width and different height. And different width according to the size of the office, the size of the room, meeting rooms or individual cell offices, whatever. And of course, the different orientation, east, north, west, and accordingly, the different size of the panels. And applied to the facade, and that's uh, the layout of these different versions, and put them back in the tower, we have double height even, we create an enormous um, variety of uh, expression, of sculptural expression, with this very simple element um, that we did in a kind of um, artificial material uh, panels. Uh, we decided for, to go for white, which of course works best with the sunlight conditions uh, and with the idea of the inside not being um, 
inspired or influenced by colors that uh, would not be appropriate in, a, in an office or in a business context. Of course, I could speak more about the detailing of the foot, of the, how we attach them, that we make them like mechanical elements, etc. But I think you, this image, I think, is quite, kind of interesting because it, it shows how much it all of a sudden becomes almost an organic dimension with a very simple element that is arranged in a very rational way. Now the Unterlinden project is of course a totally different thing, but I like its context to this idea of the city and the life in the city, the careful way to treat with an idea of urban space, of um, public space, of the street, of possible meeting places, and to use the context, whether it's a headquarter of a bank or whether it's a museum, uh, is actually not so decisive. Colmar is um, a small city in the north of Basel, between Mulhouse and Strasbourg. It's about uh, 45 minutes from Basel. And it's a city which has kept its medieval character. It has almost uh, a site that is remindful of Venice due to its open canals that you see, especially in the old part of the city, um, which have kept not only a practical site, but now become, of course, a tourist attraction. It's a very much a tourist city. Um, it has quite a number of historically important buildings, monastery, convents, churches, and other buildings, nice buildings. But especially, it is world class for one thing. It has this uh, convent that we talk about where which was turned into a museum, I think, in the 18th or 19th century. Uh, that's the look of it outside, as it was presenting itself before our intervention. It is known for this painting, which is certainly one of the greatest uh, medieval, Renaissance medieval paintings in, uh, of um, German Renaissance uh, by Matthias Grünewald, the Isenheim Altar, early 16th century. This is really a mad, almost surrealistic uh, painting, and it attracts visitors from all over the world. Everybody knows this from the art world, but also beyond the art world. And you can see, uh, I don't now, of course, uh, want to speak about the building, uh, the, the, that um, altarpiece. I just recommend you go see it. It's very inspirational. It's surely, uh, it's 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 really amazing. So we were, of course, very happy when uh, we were contacted uh, to renovate the site. Uh, not so much originally the space where this altarpiece was shown. This is an old image, how it was presented together with other important paintings by Martin Schongauer. Martin Schongauer is another great, great Renaissance painter who is from, Le from Colmar. Um, that's how it was presented in, until the 50s, till after the war, and then was transformed into kind of a gym with this kind of weird floor and this kind of, kind of bazaar style way to present it. And um, now, after the renovation, this is of course still too empty, but that's how it presents itself now in the freshly restored church. But I will speak about now the whole project. This is the convent as it presented itself urbanistically, cut away from its former context, the Ackerhof, this was one kind of building context. The space in between oh, is an almost um, um, deteriorated, um, abandoned, or a kind of a bus station. And so immediately we thought, when 
we got the job to renovate this and to incorporate Les Bains, this is a neo-baroque building, that we would first of all see it as an urbanistic project to bring together that, to make this something that works together. And paradoxically, we found a solution in cutting it into two pieces even more, in that we opened again this little river that was hidden under the street that was once in the medieval time open and was part of that system of canals that I showed you before. So that was one ingredient, almost like a symmetrical axis that is between the convent site and the Ackerhof with the neo-baroque building and our new basilica, basilica that I will explain, and this little pivotal building that I would also explain later. So I will speak about the different interventions, which is the restoration and making this into a unit again, the basilica, the monastery, and the wing where you enter. Um, before our intervention, everybody entered on this side, which was quite awkward. Now we open this side and show a face to this plaza, the new Place in Unterlinden, with the water canal in the middle, this little pivotal little house, and the Ackerhof, which was once the kind of um, service court for the convent. So to bring these two elements together. That is the urban plan. The other thing is then the architectural methods to do this, and the third level is the museography, the museographical idea, which I also will briefly um, present. We have been working together with uh, Jean-Francois Chevrier, who is a French theoretician and uh, writer uh, and a specialist in contemporary art, especially photography, that we've been working with already in previous projects. That's again the urban plan, the canal, this little pivot, the new basilica and the old convent and the alcohol of this new place. First element, the restoration of this part. This is gonna host our medieval ethnographical and archeological pieces, especially of course the altarpiece of Grünewald, the Schongauer paintings and other spaces. So we freshed up and renovated and brought back the spaces in the monastery that were totally deteriorated and in bad condition. That's the space between these two buildings after our intervention with the freshly opened canal, this little house that I will explain later, and that facade which now is the main entrance into the convent. And that's the new basilica, this new wing for contemporary art that speaks to the old building. First, we renovated the church. You can see the, the kind of juxtaposition on the other side, the new basilica, which is like the brother element of this piece here. We wanted the old and the new to be like defining, like framing the whole urban plan. So we tried to make the courtyard around um, this amazing piece of architecture in this central courtyard, really again a suite or a sequence of interesting spaces. For this reason, we had to remove all this stuff here, which could be like in a bathroom, and we brought back, this is still not finished, this space, we brought back the amazing uh, quality of the old spaces, which were more appropriate for the collection of 14th and 15th, uh, for 15th and 16th century painting. Especially the ceiling is very interesting because to do the ceiling in the medieval time, they reused wood that they found from different buildings. So that in itself is an amazing piece of architecture that was uh, hidden behind this um, ceiling. 
the, uh, the Grünewald piece that I already briefly spoke about in its new presentation. So that's this part here, this wing and this wing. And now our intervention in this entrance part here, we reopened this part, so the main entrance goes through here, and then we totally renovated this. We brought it back to an original state, which it never really had, but we removed all these small walls that were taking away some of the generosity and the openness and the permeability towards the central court. And we also did not want to bring in a modern language that immediately you could see, well, that's the old, that's the new. I don't think that this is interesting to show to visitors what is old and what is new. When you look carefully, it's clear. You immediately see what is old and new. But we, that's why we decided to work with the pointed arch as an ingredient in an abstracted way that would make that transition much more smooth and much more interesting and to make it much more especially into one thing and not into two things, but something that would, be, uh, would allow for a much more interesting walk and a more organic walk through all these spaces. All these things are of course new, but especially it has two elements. It has this kind of doors which are always having these pointed arches like deep spaces and those stairs that are winding themselves through the building. We developed a lamp just for this building and also furniture. From that stair, actually, you go from the main reception room down into this corridor, this kind of gallery that is connecting the old wing with the new wing, the old um, convent with the new basilica. This is a decisive element to connect it down where then you encounter this pivot element on the ground. That's before the intervention. So this is really literally hidden away or cut away, and that's the bus station. And that's how it looks now. This little house here sits on top of this corridor that is connecting these, this wing and that wing. And this house is inspired by this little building that sits exactly in the same place that was the entrance gate to the former um, um, Ackerhof that was like a farm somehow to um, um, support the convent. And we somehow liked that element very much in that it is a link between these two elements and especially it breaks down the scale between this and this. So it's like an element that it was very risky to do this and modern architects wouldn't normally want to do this. But we were very interested in it and tested it many times. It's a very simple form, but these simple forms, as you know, is something we are very fascinated with and we believe have a very strong potential. Whenever we use it, we don't use it as a trademark, as it may appear. We use it when we believe it makes sense. And um, in this case, this little house that of course has a much more abstract form than the previous one. We tried something that was almost a copy, but that would be too much of a Hollywoodian simulation. Is of course a place to gather before you go into the Ackerhof, but also it is a big skylight. It's a skylight that sits on top of this connecting space underneath that you can see in and out. And especially that is a very good way to, like a paver, between this and that. And also, it's not just sitting on top as a decoration, but it has a, 
it has a depth, it has a function, it is like a lantern that brings daylight and orientation between the upper side and the lower connecting gallery. As you can see here, that's where this little house sits on top, and that's the connecting gallery. This is not just a corridor, but it is a gallery that is very carefully curated by Jean-Francois. And that's the kind of daylight that comes down from the street. So that's this element here, and that's under, underneath this connecting piece. <coughs> then we have done this little place here, this little garden with the trees, and then finally, of course, the, basil the new basilica, which is the place for contemporary art, which is here. And they are done in the same material that we will talk about later. You can see the pointed arch, the Gothic windows, which are reappearing in a more abstract way. We were sure, and that's also, of course, risky, that's also something that architects, contemporary architects, don't do. We were extreme, I was extremely fascinated and attracted by that, especially how to do this. You cannot just do this. You cannot just make a Gothic window. But it's interesting to find out how you could do it so it works. And you can also not just do a basilica again with this very simple form, but what exactly, how exactly do you do this? And we then tried to literally cut away a piece and gave it a, a very interesting um, hint of modernity and of an, like a barn that would make more sense in the context of the former Ackerhof. This building has three floors, exhibition floors, and this kind of big stairwell with this kind of stair that winds itself up and down in a similar way as the stair that I showed you before, which brings people down from the convent into the sunken gallery. That also is something that we studied very carefully, that is a space in itself in that basilica, which has the same materiality and the same formal language as in the convent. So that, again, is very important to not make these stupid steel stairs and this kind of transparent glass, whatever lifts, but to make this as a an element which speaks with the other one, which has a coherence. Now the exhibition spaces are special. The panels, we've done something which is forbidden again. To make walls, I always hated this when I saw that in the 50s in the National Gallery, walls should be on the floor for the simple reason that the painting should be presented in a more or less solid and simple context. We made an exception here because the spaces are a bit low and a bit narrow, and especially uh, we believe it was interesting to do this in the context of this very collection of Ecole de Paris, the kind of French equivalent to abstract expressionism, uh, which is in itself a modernistic movement where these panels, these kind of flying elements come from. And indeed, the character of the space, this kind of breathing character, is working very well with this particular kind of art that is part of their collection. They, the contemporary collection, is, in fact, stops in the 50s and 60s, which is the high um, point or high moment for this kind of modern French movement. So again, even the, these walls are to do with the particular or specific given, even in this kind of almost neo-medieval context that had a reason, uh, we introduced something which has a totally different um, historic context, which is this modernistic 1950s kind of walls.
It was opened last Saturday, actually, by Monsieur Hollande, and um, it was, of course, well received by the French because it's an example that in the periphery that is an, an ongoing obsession of the French that too much concentration is of course the focus on Paris as the only city in France that high class or great quality uh, I speak of uh, Schoengau and Grunewald of course is also happening in the periphery of their country. Going back to the materiality we somehow liked that kind of uh, strange masonry which was fixed many times. It also was changed. This is an intervention of 19th century and 18th century um, breaking up the medieval um, um, window. So it's really a, a, a mixture, a mosaic of different times. And we like the roughness of the materiality which is natural stone and brick in a mixture. This roughness was also the reason why we decided to go for something that is not the same thing, but has, has a, a kind of a very rough, unusual character. And we developed this kind of te technique to break the brick and to um, show the broken side outside instead of the, the good side. So we put it the outside in or the inside out and made different tests. We have tested this technique already in the context of Chinese projects that were never realized, but find this a good moment to take this heavily burned brick, rather dark brick, which you find a lot in the Alsace context, and to develop this kind of wall, which the nice thing is, has more the effect of some knitted uh, work rather than of masonry. Now the Gothic window, from the beginning, we knew that we wanted something that has, um, that was just cut out so that you can see this is not really um, an arch in stone as a finished form, but is potentially just as if you cut it out with the scissor. So we had to carefully study how to hold it up in place and especially also how to morph the form outside to the inside where we didn't want to have the same kind of, um, the same kind of um, pointed arch. So the space, the window would describe a kind of a morphing between outside, exper um, um, outside um, expression and interior uh, regularity or interior uh, frame. So we did not want to do what the medieval masonry has done or neo-Gothic in the 19th century or even 20th century Gothic, which was always falling in the trap of doing this kind of concise framing, which has a much more um, conventional appearance and is much more a finished given form rather than something that has a fuzziness. So we tested in the mock-up how to do this and to maintain some of this kind of uh, fragile, fragility that we also like very much in the surface of the broken brick. As I said, we wanted an out exterior and an interior form to come together and to make for what is that window so that you can see that here that it's a niche that you can go in and that inside is a rectangle form. It's not very well visible here. And the morphing creates again some kind of, uh, kind of interesting organic form that can be interpreted in different ways. But um, I think that image shows quite well the potential of, um, of those little niches uh, within the basilica. <coughs> and indeed, when you go there, that's also the reaction that you get from people. Whether you like it or not, it's a different thing, but it works. People feel very much like this is part of the convent. On the other side, it's become really something that 
is working as a new hole with this water canal in the middle. Now I show a last project in very few images, Chazerouk. That's a very Swiss, ugly world somehow. It's very guttural. But what is interesting for those who speak German, this does not mean Chaz, means cheese. But this here is actually a Roman Latin word and means Kaiser, like Caesar, and means emperor. And Ruck means um, the back. So it's the back of the emperor. And it's um, an alpine station in a very beautiful part of Switzerland, in the pre-Alps, not too far. It's in the southeast of uh, Zurich. Um, and the interesting thing is that the client, is a private project, owns that lift and those two stations. And we started with this top to remodel this here, and I will speak about that piece here on the altitude of about 2,100 meters, a ski station and the ski lift. And in the next phase, we will develop a little hotel here and a little station here. And you can see the beauty of this amazing landscape. That's this Chazerouk, this kind of back, um, which is like a cliff above a, a lake and you can see the Alps in the back here. So these mountains are just about 2,200 meters high, whereas the Alps in the back are f double as high. Of course, the beauty attracted us, and when I say it's a puzzle piece of metropolitan Switzerland, it means that the interesting thing is that Switzerland is nowhere real, very urban, but nowhere also very rural. It is, it ha, it's the most urbanized landscape, perhaps, uh, that I know. And it's certainly interesting that within an hour or two, you can literally go from one place to another. And so these kind of resorts or whatever the intervention would be here is something that almost has an urban character. You can go there within very short time. That's uh, in the valley, and that's the in-between station, and that's the top. And that's a diagram which shows the plan. This is existing, but is in bad shape. That's a very kind of interesting um, um, kind of a train that is running on a track that has a very consistent stone architecture. And from there, the next um, run, the next uh, phase on the next sequence is um, a cable car, is a kind of fun funicular um, train that brings people up to the top station. And that's how it looked before our intervention. Uh, rather ugly, I mean, it's just separate the station where the cable car arrives, then you have a kind of a shack, and uh, you don't stay longer than needed because it's just to drink some warm tea, but it doesn't have any quality of you want to stay, you want to do more than just uh, have a drink and then go back again. So the client said, we could do more here because take more advantage of the beauty of the landscape and of the possibilities to ski in winter and to hike in summer. And um, so, we decided to not leave that village, but to try to incorporate everything into one thing. So it's just one spot. That should look like this. And that already, let's say, the way the funicular arrives um, is a surprise, or tries to create something special with, in that it cuts out what is not needed, but leaves the rest, in the, and, and thus creates a kind of, a, like a key that enters into um, a lock and opens up um, a totally different world than you would expect uh, there. 
And that's how we have worked on this project. It has these three elements, basically. Uh, the um, arrival point for the car, the, the cable car, then the gastronomic part and the big roof, or the service part and the restaurant or the bar and the roof on top. And of course we had to re redo this uh, whole technical part at the same time. All of that we wanted to um, cover and restructure with one single material, which is wood. So the challenge was to find a structure that would work uh, in a very simple way, but also could, with this cantilever, resist the very strong wind forces it has uh, up there. And uh, with the rather small surface that was given on the top of that rock with the cantilevers that we wanted um, not to do too much in a daring way, but we had to accept some cantilevers, so everything together uh, is working as a structural as well as a sculptural piece. Again, here, uh, what is form making is at the same time structural and ornamental. Also here, lamp and furniture, everything is part of the architecture, a part of the whole expression of the building. It's very simple, basic, but um, the plan is, of course, when once the hotel will go in the middle station, that people would be able to use that whole infrastructure also um, outside, let's say, uh, functions that you could do during the day. So it has, uh, it would also be allow for parties or uh, use the restaurant for other purposes. For this purpose, we designed these niches, which are nice to have lunch, but you can also close them so they work like little chambers. So you can sleep there. Uh, like in a train or like in these capsules. So it's, it, we worked on this kind of intimate, intimate space versus the larger space around it. It also attracts locals, as you can see. Um, and um, yeah, that's the last image. That's this kind of cantilever uh, towards the a rather amazing landscape. Um, that's the last picture, and um, thank you for your attention. If you like to um, talk and ask some questions, or I would be very happy to do that. Um, if possible. Let me just ask you a couple of quick questions, maybe, while people get warmed up. Um, you, you explained that there are 11 projects that were finished in 2015, and you showed four. Yeah. Um, what was the criteria for choosing the four? Um, Well, I thought that Unterlind and Baby Uva would be very interesting to compare, and that was um, um, those were given. And then Hazaruk, I think, was interesting because nobody expects us to do something like that. And also, of course, we don't have yet so many pictures that show the beauty of this. I think it's a very, very beautiful little project. So I wanted to show that we like to work on such projects. This is very intense, you have to do a lot of, make a lot of effort to make it work, but we do that as much as we do the Tau for Roche or Baby UVA or larger scale projects. I think that's very important. That was the important thing. And the same is true for Miu Miu. I think you have to see it somehow. It's a bit stupid to, to present it because it's not so spectacular. But when you see it and are there, then it's quite interesting. So I think that was the criterion for me to show small scale and rather larger things. But of course, I could have 
when you uh, mentioned that in your introduction, it would have been interesting to show, to present Bordeaux together with uh, Allianz Arena. But I somehow had in the back of my mind that it would have been nice to show Chelsea, but it's not yet possible, you know? So that, I think that's always interesting. This is a school, so this didactic moment to explain things in, the, in, the, in comparison, I think is more interesting than to just show something sure. because it is nice or attractive or spectacular. We are less and less interested in that side. We are much more interested in, in actually I also don't really know whether something is great or just good or, or really great or really mediocre, you know. I, we don't have these kind of terms. We just like to work with a great intensity on things and, and try to really understand what we do and why we do something. And that's how then I speak, but I could have as well taken any other project, honestly. Yeah, no, part of the reason why I asked you is because <laughs> with the idea of you doing so many variations of the same project, like the stadium or the museum, there is the question of what is the relationship of one to the other. And I think with the number of the projects that you showed, for example, with Miu Miu, and then showing the starting with uh, Aoyama, um, there is always this relationality of what you had done and now you're going to do something different and the way that you see Miu Miu through the lens of Prada and it's of course a very different building, it has very different materials, or the way in which the Colmar project is dealing with all that new, the question of historic preservation, the introduction of a new kind of building in that, in that context. So all of those, I think, also were very interesting in terms of the relationship of something to a precedent, to another moment, to something else that you had done. And <clears throat> I think just in terms of the discussion of um, typology, um, because this was also such an important part of your own upbringing, your own education, your work with Aldo Rossi you know, as a, as a teacher, I'm just wondering whether you can speak about this idea of the transformations that happen with something which is a type. Like you said that Bordeaux, in some ways you're right that if, if you do that in England, it's too, um, fragile. too fragile and in England it needs to be tougher. It would be seen as too, too sensitive for, for the crowd in a way. So how is it that something is a type, but it's also, in a way, dependent on these variations of condition? And you could see Miu Miu in the same kind of light because it's a retail building versus the sort well, of... Well, I, I think that um, we can, of course, you know, I could speak endlessly about things and uh, it would be great once to just speak about Absolutely. renovation, preservation. Mm -hmm. I, I was uh, giving a talk in uh, New York in, at the Armory because we do this renovation, preservation job in the Armory. And would have been interesting to talk about this in the context of Colmaros also because I think that our approach to preservation is different than it was, for instance, for, uh, for Scarpa or for others where the juxtaposition, where what we do here would have been a nightmare, you know? Uh, so this is... Uh, somehow we were very much also thinking about the thinking of uh, Ruskin, you know, in the 19th century, who was, of course, a very ideological person, but also Viola Le Duc was ideological in some way. And um, so our attitude is different, but I'm very aware that it's also a historical position that is, again, another position, but it's Interesting because it says something about our time. It's psychological. Architecture is highly psychological. And that's why architecture is highly specific. Architecture is and has never been generic. Never. It is specific. And that's why <coughs> our buildings are different. It's not that we want to be so funny to make them different. But they are different because in Spain, something is different as a different ingredient, a different ingredients than in France. And it's not that I want to give the French what is French, what I believe as coming from Switzerland, this is French, but this is like if you look at the city, at the place, I think these are things that an architect 
understands and and does i don't say automatically but you it has a logic behind that you know um and um yeah but we don't have Bordeaux now here but i could give you so um any other example you know i think that um of course baby uva couldn't be done in england either you know or in france it's a Absurd. I think it's very Spanish. It's very. It has a very more Moorish, Moorish kind of a influence in that project. Maybe this part of the city reminds me more of southern Spain than somehow the center of Madrid, because perhaps because it's more deserted, more arid. I don't know. But that somehow I think is inherent in that project. Maybe we'll see if some of our Spanish friends will agree with your with your with your comments. But are there any um, questions, comments, Catherine? Yeah. Um, Do we have a mic? If you can just wait for the mic. Thank you. I've o I've always been struck um, by the fact that your work seems completely fearless in the sense that you are not afraid of the Gothic window. Um, the Gothic window. I mean, how? One avoids a kind of, um, you know, typological uh, uh, face-off, you know, which is what really the pa passage of time and history and so forth is based on constant, you know, throwing things away or putting them at a distance in order to then, re you know, sort of push in another position. And you, and so it's a, it's kind of astonishing that it's you almost anoint. The, the gothic window with a sort of contemporaneity that um, gives it a chance to come back and you know have a role to play. But it's a really, you know, it's very unusual, I think. Uh, partly because, I mean, it's like Francis Bacon says, you have to really do battle with precedent. You can't, you can't, you can't do portraiture anymore. You can't do gothic churches anymore. So. And so I'm not sure you're doing battle. You seem to be, you know, able to enter into that very, uh, you know, very delicately with, you know, massive structures. So I find that really interesting. I mean, I don't know if there, you agree or what. Well, you know. I, I very much appreciate what you say. I honestly am, maybe that's a, a question of getting older, but I was always attracted by things that are forbidden and if we look back, um, modernity has forbidden so many things for no good reason. And I said a bit naively. I, I when I t this afternoon, I, I for the first time, I was thinking when I speak about this project that the new basilica wants to speak to the convent because I think that they look at each other, and I think. The windows, and that's maybe a naive way to explain it, but it has something. They look out, they look at each other, and windows are like eyes in a building. A child sees windows like an eye in a face, and they look at each other. And why should they not have a similarity? But when you come close, it's obvious this is not a medieval window, it's different. But it has this moment. It has like a moment, and it's not a simulation, it's not a Hollywoodian, um, um, copy, you know, I think that's very different. And more we work with preservation projects, I mentioned the Armory, I'm aware of this. In America, preservation, and we've had battles, this were, these were battles, they want you to do, to delayer a space, this is something we also want to do, but we want to keep the naked surface of what is there. And then we bring back a kind of a ground tone so that when you go in a space, you don't see all these flaws and that was amended like Scarpa has done, for instance. He, he wants to see, oh, this was a wound or, or Dölgast was doing this after the war. And I understand them for psychological reasons. We are not interested in that anymore. I want to go in a space and then I want to understand the space as it was. And when I go closer, I see, oh, 
that's not really what it was. So it's, but it's in a very simple way, just has the ground tone, let's say. And this is like the ground tone. And then you go closer, and then it's another painting, or it's another surface, or it's another way to make it or produce it. And that's difficult to find, because you have to find a s solution for every specific case. There is not standard solutions. And in the armory, the spaces were very different. Some were very damaged. And then the American way to preserve is to find out how it was. And then they make on top of the old layer, they make a new one, which is exactly like the old, but it's a total fake. That's like silicon breasts or like these kind of things. That's a totally different mentality, you know? And I, I'm not against that. Not at all. <laughs> not at all. No, I'm not again. I'm just saying it. I'm just saying that this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm just saying. I think this is interesting. That you have to you you touch, you touch the 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 real mentality, which is different, you know. And um, and we stand for another attitude in preservation, and that's why I think it's interesting to discuss and. Honestly, uh, we continue this exploring this kind of potential of history, and uh, it's absurd to believe that architecture, like that was me's obsession, of course, that there is something beyond. That is the ultimate new. That is the ultimate new language. That is the real sublime. This is the most stupid, intellectually stupid idea you can have. And this is over. But I don't think that we have a better solution. We just have a different one. And finally, I've understood a little bit what are the ingredients to, to deal with this? And to make a project is just a proposal to do it this way. It should not be affirmative. I think projects should always have a little moment of hesitation. And I think that can be seen in the... In, that's also why we very often have surfaces which have a, a kind of an irritation at the surface. And this broken brick has that. It's a very fragile, but nevertheless very powerful um, materiality. Any other? Please. Thank you so much for sharing your projects with us. Uh, I want to ask an irresponsibly naive question um, after maybe two or three observations. So the first uh, is that maybe you'll agree that uh, uh, many of the projects you show talk about architecture in the here and now, an architecture that's about being there uh, and about kind of understanding it. Everyone's kind of looking around, I'll stand. Uh, about being there and understanding it in that way. That's my first observation. Um, my second is uh, about something that happened when you approached the podium, which was lots of people wanted to take photos of you. Um, and I think this is kind of interesting. Uh, in relation to the first observation. Uh, in other words, how the architect is related to the here and now that he creates. And, and the third observation, I guess, is a word that you repeated a number of times, which is intervention, uh, throughout the, the projects you showed. Uh, you were speaking about interventions on, on previously built works uh, or in the city. And my naive question is, what do you think uh, the architect should be doing today? What is his mandate, his or her mandate? Um, what is the, the kind of urgent problem of architecture that he has been called to answer? Uh, how, how, how do you think about that question? You have many questions at a time, but <clears throat> a few are simple. The here and now is the only interesting thing in our lives, I think. And architecture is interesting because it expresses that more than anything else. Architecture is only that. But of course, um, we live in that world where most of the people know the projects through uh, websites or through illustrations or, or publications. and. Sometimes if you go see them, you're disappointed. Sometimes, sometimes um, you're not. It's even better. But I think that architecture only survives when this here and now continues to really function. If you, I mean, I always take the same example, a Gothic cathedral or any great building. If you're there, you could not imagine your impression 
how it was before you had seen it. It's now that this effect is so different from the purely visual impression. And that's what I mean by here and now. And it's also is the same thing of, of, of your own physical experiences and so sensual experiences that you can do with your body is different from just looking, I hope. And, and that's, that's the same thing. Architecture is very much bound to our archaic human conditions. That's the great thing about it. That's why I hope it continues to survive. And um, the other thing is, what can you do as an architect? I, I, I don't know, but I gave two examples, which I think is sometime, something we try to do, is that a, a project has always a potential, always. And good architecture is if you exploit the potential. You can always exploit it a bit or less. I make a comparison with football. There are you have 11 players and you have two different trainers. One trainer is successful or more successful than the other one. Why? Because the good one exploits the potential of the team more. Is it more offensive? Is it more defensive? Is it more in, you know, in a, in a ball possession kind of a way that you try to train them and to instruct them? So those are that seems ridiculous, a comparison, but it's pretty much what you do as an architect. You can do a building that has a, a potential to open up part of a city, to make it public and lively, or you can make it hermetic and it's a lost, it's a waste of money. That's what is architecture. Architecture is not about if you like it or not, that's very personal, but if it's good or not, it's not personal. And I say that here so that I please God, beauty is everything. But beauty is not, beauty is not decoration. Beauty is a much more complex thing. But beauty is really, and if I give you the advice, go for beauty, uh, it, you cannot, that doesn't help you, you know? So I think you have to have strategy and break down things. And when I said the urban, urbanistic potential and then the architectural potential and then the museological or museographic potential, these are the standard lines for this project. That's how we tried to proceed. Maybe, you know, one of the things that was very clear with the four projects is also, in some ways, the differences in the qualities of the interiors. And you spent a lot of time looking up this word furtive. Um, <clears throat> and I was sort of imagining the transparency, the openness of the, the Prada store. And then, in a way, there's a kind of sensuality of the Miu Miu and the the, the idea that the box is almost closed. There's a kind of secret thing. It's just opening and you get this kind of glimpse mm -hmm. into the interior, which is almost like a kind of illicit, mm -hmm. uh, you know, look inside the interior with those fabrics and materials and, and things like that. And yet, you know, that kind of quality is very different than the mountain of lodge, course, of course, yeah. where you know yeah. it's a it's a very different kind of sensibility. I think a lot of people are interested in this question of the issue of the sen the sense or the sensibility of the interior. Um, what do you mean by furtive? Uh, exactly. There is actually uh, there is actually another word that I didn't know, which is even more interesting than furtive. Um, um, I have to, ah, I got it. Surreptitious. Surreptitious, huh? Surreptitious. 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 Surreptitious, yeah. That's surreptitious glance. More, surreptitious glance. It's even more difficult than that's, that's That's, 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 um, that's interesting because I think transparency is, 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 actually not so interesting. I think what's to do, what is behind transparency is perception, is our way to perceive something. And perception is just a, a means, it's just a way to do this. But the gap, the little gap, 
this kind of furtive moment is another strategy for the same thing. Ultimately, we are very interested in issues of perception. We have been as close as we have been uh, trained, of course, by Lucius Burkhardt and Aldo Rossi. We have been close to artists, like especially um, Remy Zauk, but also, of course, without knowing him at that time, Gerhard Richter, where mm -hmm. artists who are extremely um, focusing on issues of perception and illusion and... So the uh, nature of the encounter with the piece is different between the Aoyama and the directness yes, of yes, that visibility yes, to yeah, yeah. this almost um, hesitant, different ways of, of sort of coming across the Miu Miu. Yes. And yes. that's not so direct. Yeah. And also, but the less, maybe less important in that context, Miu Miu as, a, as objects, as fashion, I don't know how well people know that, have a much more... Um, erotic and much more exclusive character. So mm -hmm. full transparency on that material would be absurd. Mm -hmm. You know, like <clears throat> all at the same. So it's more like in the boudoir. Exactly, it's more like a boudoir, like this. And um, so we try, of course, also to do things which make sense for the client, not only uh, for the city and etc. But it's more interesting to talk about that in such a context. But as I said, with Mew Chaprada, the, these discussions are super interesting, and uh, it's only about these things that we, that we talk. So Jacques, thank you so much for sharing these beautiful projects. <laughs> <laughs> Fabulous. <laughs>